On this particular night, we are honoring ministers and educators. I was sitting there thinking a moment ago, there have been a lot of preachers who've made a huge impact in my life. Uh, my favorite preacher is my pastor, my dad, and I'm very grateful to God for him. And a lot of preacher friends here in this meeting. All day today, I've been getting messages from preachers in different parts of the country. You may be even surprised. Uh, certain regions of the country, you think, they, they wouldn't even know we're here. Oh, yes. And people saying, we've heard about the meeting there. We're praying God will bless it tonight. I thank God for ministers. But I must tell you, it was not a preacher that led me to Jesus. Well, she was a preacher, but she wasn't the kind of preacher you think. She never gave a sermon or stood behind a pulpit, but she preached the gospel to me. It was a teacher that led me to Jesus. She could be in the meeting tonight or she could be watching online. I see her. Is she here tonight? Wonderful. And she led me to the Lord nearly 40 years ago. She took a Bible and shared Jesus with me. And when I stand on a night like tonight to speak to others and tell them of Christ, my mind goes back to the night that it first became real to me. You see, it has to become personal. It has to become real. Now, this week, I've been showing you from one verse of Scripture things that last. And the reality is it's not just material, physical things that don't last. We all know this world someday is going to be gone. These bodies don't last. Lots of things like that don't last forever. But even good things don't last forever. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter number 13, Paul talks about some of those things. Would you open your Bible with me again to this amazing chapter of the Bible? 1 Corinthians 13, of course, is the famous love chapter. It's all about the love of God. And when you come to the end of it, you come to the great climactic verse, the divine exclamation point, 1 Corinthians 13, 13. And now, abideth faith, hope, charity. These three. But the greatest of these is charity. And if you look at the verses that preceded, he talks about lots of things that don't last, even good things, miracles and knowledge and certain understanding and things come and go. But when you boil it all down, let's just get to the bottom line tonight. It's, it's the last night. Let's get right to the bottom line. If you want something that lasts, then you need to know the eternal God. Now, when the Bible says that these three things last, faith, hope, and charity, by the way, those three things are connected uh, together at least 10 times in the New Testament. That's interesting to me. Not just in this verse. God always connects this little trio of faith, hope, and charity. They go together. Why? Because all of it connects us to Jesus. Our faith is in the Lord Jesus. Our hope comes from the Lord Jesus. Our understanding of the love of God is seen in the Lord Jesus. When we say people need faith, people need hope, people need love, what we're really saying is people need Jesus. We started on the first night by talking about a faith that lasts. I, I sure hope you put your faith in the Lord Jesus. And I hope your faith is growing every day. And by the way, if tonight you don't know for sure that your faith is in Jesus Christ, before you leave here, you need to know that. You need a faith that's going to last. Look, when you get old and when you die and when you step out of this world into the next and your faith becomes sight, you need to know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Somebody say, well, you know, preacher, my faith is pretty weak. Can I help you with that? It is not the strength of your faith that saves. It is the object of your faith. All of us have times when our faith is weak. You see things going on in the world and your faith gets shaken a little bit. Let me give you some good news tonight. Are you ready? Your faith might be shaken, but if your faith is in God, the object of your faith is never shaken because God never changes. In fact, he even said, if we believe not, yet he abideth faithful. He cannot deny himself. What a wonderful God we serve. And then last evening we talked about a hope that lasts. And there's a divine order here. The, the faith leads to the hope. And this hope is not wishful thinking. It's not cross your fingers and hold on. I, I hope it's going to turn out all right. That's not what we're talking about at all. 
Now, I'm not preaching some positive mental attitude tonight where you get up in the morning and psych yourself up and say, all right, it's going to be a good day today. You can tell yourself that and it may still be a bad day. The reality is we need something more than surface superficial emotionalism. We need something that we can build a life upon. We need reality. We need a foundation in God. Do you know what the difference between optimism and faith is? I'm an optimist. Let's take a survey. How many optimists are in the room? Would you raise your hand, please? Good. How many pessimists? Be honest, all you pessimists, all right? How many of you are afraid to vote? Would you raise your hand, please? I really want to know what you are. I'd ask the people that live at your house. I guarantee you they know. My wife would tell you and he, he's an optimist and sometimes too optimistic. He, he is overly optimistic about certain things. I've learned that optimism can be misplaced, but faith in Jesus is never misplaced. Do you know what the difference in optimism and faith is? Optimism hopes the situation will get better, but faith hopes in the God who is always good. Even if the situation doesn't get better, I'm glad to tell you that the God of all hope can still be believed. And so we have a faith that lasts, a hope that lasts, and then, thank God, a love that lasts. The Bible word used here, would you mark it in your Bible, is the word charity. When I think charity, I immediately see somebody from the Salvation Army at Christmas time. And so do you. When we think charity, we immediately think, all right, we're going to give something to help the poor. And for the record, we ought to do that. And that's a very good expression of charity. But that is not the meaning of this word. The word charity here is not human love. It is divine love. It is a word that is reserved in Scripture for the love that God has for us, which, by the way, is a love that excels all understanding. I'm, I'm sorry, I cannot even think of the right words to describe it because this love is deeper and broader and higher and longer than any love you have ever known. And that's why, that's why God saves it for last. Not because it's least, but because it is greatest. If I didn't know this was in the Bible, I wouldn't say this, but look at the verse again. The second half of the verse not only identifies these three lasting things that abide, but notice it says, but the greatest of these is what? You know, we overstate things a lot. Everybody's the greatest now. The greatest of all time. The greatest athlete, the greatest musician, the greatest businessman, the greatest whatever, you fill in the blank. You know what I've learned about that? Somebody greater is always going to come along behind you. No, no. When God says the greatest, this is not human hyperbole. This is divine revelation. This is not overstatement. This is God's statement of truth. God himself says the greatest thing on earth is the love of God. D.L. Moody was an evangelist. An evangelist, I look forward to meeting when I get to heaven, Brother Fox. A man that was mightily used of God, he was preaching in England, and he met a young minister by the name of Henry Morehouse. And Morehouse was just a young preacher, but he was full of the Lord, and Moody was so impressed with him. He said, Morehouse, if you ever come to the United States, you preach in my church in Chicago. Let me know when you arrive in America. Some months passed, and young Henry Morehouse sent a telegram to D.L. Moody and said, I've arrived. Moody said, well, the, the dates that you're going to be in Chicago, I'll be out of town, but if you'll come, I'll organize meetings for you. You speak in my pulpit, and the men will take good care of you. Moody went off on his trip. Morehouse came to town. Morehouse conducted a series of meetings, something like we've been in this week, and he preached every night. When Neil Moody got home late one evening, he said to his wife, how have the meetings been? She, the pastor's wife, said, oh, the best meetings we've ever had. May I just tell you, when the guest preacher comes to town, that's not what your pastor wants to hear. Especially from his wife. And Moody said, oh yes, he's a fine young preacher. And she started crying and she said, no, that's not it. She said, it's what he's been talking about. He said, well, what's he preached on? She said, John 3.16. He said, wonderful, wonderful, that's a wonderful verse. What else? She said, that's all. 
She said, every night that young minister stood behind the pulpit and read, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And she said, Dwight, every night it's been fresh. Every night it's like heaven opened to us and we've seen the love of God. Moody said, I gotta hear this for myself. He went to the meeting that evening. When Morehouse saw uh, the famous evangelist walk in, he said, oh, Mr. Moody, I'm glad you're back. You speak in your pulpit tonight. And Moody said, no, I'm just here to listen tonight. You preach as, as scheduled. And they said Moody sat front and center right in front of the pulpit as close as he could get to Morehouse. Theo Moody would later say that night changed his life and ministry. He said, that night, though I had preached on sin and hell and judgment, that night I got a glimpse of something I had never fully seen. He said, young Morehouse walked up on the platform and with an apologetic tone said, dear friends, I apologize. I've searched all day for a different text for you tonight. I've searched the whole Bible looking for a verse that I thought might be better than the one I've been preaching from every night. And he said, then I realized if heaven itself opened up and an angel came down, he could say nothing better to you than this, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And Dio Moody said that night, he listened as that young minister poured forth just about the love of God. And Moody said, I sat there and wept like a child because for the first time in my life, I got a glimpse of how loving God really was and it changed my life forever. It truly is the greatest of these. If you don't know God, I want to tell you tonight, God loves you. If you're away from God, I want you to know God loves you exactly like you are. He can never love you any more, and he will never love you any less. There was never a day he started loving you, and there'll never be a day he stops loving you. You know why he loves you? He doesn't love you because you're good. He loves you because he's good. I'll tell you why he loves you. He loves you because he can't help himself. And may I say to every believer in the room tonight, what we need, no, what this city needs is a fresh glimpse of the God of all love came into this meeting place tonight and saw the parking lots filled with people and folks streaming into the building and it thrilled my soul it really did but then I had the staggering thought as wonderful as this assembly has been what would happen if we left here tonight so filled with the love of God in this city to show the goodness and love of God to those who do not know him I tell you what would happen it would change this area forever Many more people who will never come to a meeting like this would come to know the God who is love. It's a love that lasts. We're living in a hateful world. Have you noticed? Violence is on the rise. Things are getting harder and people are getting harsher. And would you like to know why that is? Because that's just what sin does. It hardens a man. After a while, he just gotta, he's got to kick and fight his way and scratch and claw his way through life. He's just trying to endure until he gets a glimpse of the love of God. And I've been pondering this. Why is this the greatest? I mean, honestly, how many of you think faith is a great thing? Would you say yes? How many of you think hope is a pretty great thing? So why would God say love was the greatest? May I tell you a couple reasons? Number one, it's the greatest because it's who God is. Love is not just something. It is the very character and nature of the God of the Bible. If your idea of God is some bully in heaven with a club over your head ready to squash you like a bug, I want you to know that's not the God of the Bible. Friend, if God was going to squash you like a bug, he would have done it a long time ago. God is merciful and gracious and patient. Do you know why? Because 1 John says, God is love. The Old Testament prophet Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, wrote with tears in his eyes that God loves you with an everlasting love. You know what that means? It means he cannot stop loving you because that's just who he is. Somebody said, how much does he love me? Look at the cross. Look at the cross. Come on, look at it. Hanging there on that cross. I love you this much. That's what he said. It's midnight in the middle of the day. 
as God the Father turns his back on his own son. Why? Because his son took our sin and God, a holy God, can't look on that sin. And suddenly the lights go out and a cry pierces the darkness as Christ cries from the cross, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I'll tell you why he was forsaken. He was forsaken so you could be received. He took your death so you could take his life. He took your darkness so you could take his light. He took your hell so you could take his heaven. He took your sin so you could take his righteousness. He became sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. This is not a children's fairy tale. This is not a figment of the imagination. This is not a speech I came up with you for, for you tonight. This is the truth of the eternal God. God is love. That's just who he is. Why is this love that lasts greatest? Not only because it's who he is, but it's what allows the other two to exist. In fact, you've got to go to love to figure out how to have faith and hope. Watch this, please. You can only trust somebody who loves you. And your hope can only be in somebody that loves you. Paul said it this way. He said, if God would give his son for you, if he loved you so much to give his son for you, do you really think he's going to hold any other good thing back from you? I can prove it to you. You still got your Bible open? Look at 1 Corinthians 13, verse number 7. In this description of the love of God, which really is just a description of Jesus, of Calvary love, did you ever notice in verse 7, it says that God's love beareth all things, and then notice the next two, believeth all things, hopeth all things. Hmm. Watch, please. It is love that believes and love that hopes. And it is only as you begin to understand how much God loves you and begin to respond to that love. Remember, we don't love him on our own. We love him because he first loved us. He always goes first. It is only as you begin to understand how much God loves you and respond to that, that you can believe him, that you can find your hope in him. Oh, it's the greatest of these because it's who God is. It's the greatest of these because it is what allows you to have faith and hope. But Finally, it is the greatest of these because, now listen to me carefully, it's actually where you're going to live forever. If I ask you tonight where you're going to live forever, there's only two eternal destinations. There's a real heaven and a real hell. And so somebody says, well, I'm going to heaven. Wait a minute. Let me, let me tell you where you're really going to live. You're going to live with the God of love forever. And it dawned on me something. Faith and hope have an ending. Someday, you won't need faith anymore. You know why you won't need faith? Because your faith is going to become sight. Isn't that going to be amazing? Someday, the one you've believed, you're going to see him face to face. And someday, your hope is going to become substance. Your hope is going to become reality. But watch this, please. There's no end to love. In fact, love's going to go on and on and on Look, when you leave this world and go to be with God, you're just going to start to understand the love of God. In the words of the hymn writer, you're going to go deeper and deeper into the love of God. I think when we die and leave this world or Jesus comes back and we go to be with him, the greatest adventure of all is just beginning. You think this has been exciting? You haven't seen anything yet. We're going to spend the rest of eternity coming to know how much God loves us. And that's why God says this is the greatest. Of these it's one thing to love a friend to die for a friend Jesus said greater love hath no man than this that a man lay down his life for his friend that's pretty good it's another thing to die for a stranger that's what people did on 9-11 when those first responders ran into the building they were dying for strangers but they they were laying down their lives but I tell you tonight, the amazing thing about the love of God and the reason it's the greatest is because, watch this please, God didn't just love friends and God didn't just love strangers, God loved enemies. See, our sin made us an enemy against God. And Romans 5 says that 
when we were without strength in due time Christ died for the ungodly God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners Christ died for us excuse me not when you joined a church and cleaned up your act and became a better person when you did not deserve his love he loved you and died for you and I want to stop and say thank you Jesus for loving me that way I'm convinced that a fresh glimpse of the love of God would change us all forever just days really weeks before 9-11 I was in New York City had a group of teenagers with me and we went up in the South Tower to the 107th floor to the observation deck and we looked out on the cityscape of Manhattan and just took it all in they told us the story of the tightrope walker that walked between the buildings I remember looking at all the little miniature people below and just just in awe of it all we were leaving that morning and a teenage boy that was with our group had a piece of gospel literature with him and there was a security guard there and on our way to the elevator he stopped and that old fellow was just sitting in a chair over in a corner I still remember Mark walked over to him and handed him this piece of gospel literature and said sir could I give you some good news this is about knowing Jesus and the man was very kind and he took it and on the morning that I stood like you did many of you and watched the live footage of those planes hitting those towers my first thought was that old fellow see it worked that morning had he read that literature? Did he know Jesus? Mm. Nothing like an eternal soul. On the 104th floor, there was a man who worked for a very famous business. He was a Christian. His name was Al Bracca. Al was at work early that morning, as he always was. The financial institution that he worked for was filled with lots of people who didn't know God. They all knew Al, and they kind of affectionately teased him and called him the Reverend. He wasn't a preacher, but he was a dedicated follower of Jesus. And that morning, the plane that hit his tower came in below his floor, took out every elevator, every staircase, every means of escape. And in a matter of just a few moments, it became abundantly clear to everybody on that floor they could not get out. Al Bracca did two things. I've thought so many times about that man. What would I do? If I knew I had moments to meet God, just moments, what would I do? He went to a telephone. He got an operator on the line. They could not connect him to his family. And he said to the operator, I need you to deliver a message. She would do that. About six weeks later, it would finally get to his wife and children. He said, I want you to tell them how much I love them. See, when you get near the end, the people you love, it matters. And then Al Bracca hung up the phone, went out of his office and down the hall and gathered up as many of his coworkers as he could and got them all in a conference room. There were multiple reports through messages that got off that floor before the tower collapsed of this multiple stories all saying the same thing they said there's this fellow here who works here his name is Al Bracca and he's got a whole bunch of people in a room and he's standing there talking to all of them about how they can be 100 percent sure if they die today that they're going to be with God and in the last moments of Al Bracca's life he said to all of his friends who had laughed at his faith if you'd like to know Christ and have your sins forgiven and go to heaven with me I'd like to give you the opportunity and they said all around that conference room people got down on their knees and called out to the Lord and Al Bracca led many of his friends to the Lord Jesus Christ see my friend when you get to the end some things just don't matter and only a few things do everything just doesn't last but faith does and hope does and love does because Christ does.